Hello everyone, my name is Etienne Enang. I have with me Rebecca Bednarek. So it's a pleasure to have you with me here today, Rebecca. Hi, pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So um, during my conversation with Julia, she alluded to the idea that her innovative um, ideas emerged out of necessity. So I'm wondering if you can shed some light on the experiences that led you and your team to these really brilliant ideas that you presented in this paper. Cool. No, my, of course. Um, so our, our study, the, the project was uh, an exploration of reinsurance trading practices globally over a number of different years. And, and the, the whole way we began to think about that project definitely evolved over time. And you, we take you through that journey, I hope. In, in the paper um, as, as uh, our definition of the ethnographic object changed as, as we expanded um, the data set that we were interested in. So ultimately the, the study from, from which the, um, the reflections are based um, involved 15 countries, um, uh, around 25 organizations, up to 50 subsidiaries, um, and as you, as you rightly refer, a, a, a team of us in the field, led, led by Paula and obviously my co-author in this paper, Law, um, and Paul Spee and Michael Smith. Um, and and we, we ended up amassing this, this very large um, data set um, of observations, interviews, um, and these um, immersion in these non-work related um, activities in, in this global market as well from, you know, um, the Monte Carlo um, meetings, um, Bermuda, uh, having shots in Bermuda. I didn't get to go to Bermuda, but I was mountaineering in, um, in, in Zurich. Um, and then also um, drinking at the pubs in London with, with these rich, these, these individuals, this tribe, so to speak, who were trading in, in um, this, this, this financial risk. Um, but the evolution, so we, so we basically had this huge project, this big experience together to, to, to make um, sense of. And this is where we really became, um, came to this idea of what, what made it possible was um, that the global nature of the project possible was obviously the team-based foundation of our ethnography. Um, but as I was kind of alluded to, our, uh, the whole approach in the project changed. It wasn't global. It wasn't this team-based global ethnography to start. It was actually a comparison of two different um, uh, trading centres, Bermuda and Lloyds of London. It was, it was comparative in that quite traditional sense that um, much organisational um, research was. We had two cases, albeit quite a few organisations in both of those cases. And we were going to compare the practices in each and it was only as the project evolved and we actually redefined the, the, the definition of the ethnographic object, what we were interested in. It wasn't this comparison of trading practices in two different places, but actually the singular global um, practice or nexus of practices that we then wanted to follow, therefore follow globally. And so that very, once, once we reconceived that, um, that very much um, expanded the array of sites that we that we needed to explore. So it was no longer about Bermuda and Lloyds, but we had to really think about, okay, well, what are the other salient sites globally for this for this market? Um, and and that's kind of actually where I came on board as as we as as the team realised, okay, we've got to get into continental Europe, we've got to get into um, Singapore. Um, to really understand this this practice as a global practice. Um, so yeah, there was, a, and I think I hope that's one of the centerpieces of this um, of of the the article, taking you through that journey of slowly defining this almost as as this this global um, project. That's great. So there's so many colourful ideas that are emerging from there. But I'm wondering, what would you say made this piece unique to you? 
So for me, as a reader, when I read the paper, I had so many thoughts, so many insights. I felt it was really fantastic. But I always am curious about the key mm -hmm. message for the writers, for the authors. What would you, can you reflect yeah. on, on the key message for you in this paper? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll first, I, I think for me, the, the, key, the key insight was, was really how central our definition of the ethnographic object was. That, that, that means for me if that, that shift um, that the team made from um, these separate localized sites to actually reconceiving the whole project as a process of following this nexus of global practices. Um, so for me, and, and actually, I, and, and, and how to do that, we tease out um, in, in the study. So for me, um, I, I came to the project, you know, based on this cross case, cross case comparison, multiple case study type, type approach. And so I think this, this reconceive, we were in so many multiple sites, but reconceiving it as this kind of singular whole, this process of following something um, across these multiple sites rather than necessarily comparing them um, was, was for me a key innovation that I think, that I think um, is more broadly applicable than just the, the team, the, the ethnography type aspects of, of our study. Um, but beyond that, I think um, it was as we as as we reflected on on the the literature. Um, there's of course been many many innovations in, in relation to ethnography, but it was a real. What we had done was very very different from this kind of traditional typical picture of what ethnography is, which is a single single kind of lone ranger um, ethnographer, usually white and male. Let's face it. Um, in a singular site. So we were, there were, there were many of us, we were in multiple places at once. So I think, and when we looked at the organizational literature, um, so um, of course there've been people, and we, and we draw on them in the piece who have talked about things like um, global ethnography, um, some, you know, um, titans in the field like Marcus and things. Um, but when we looked at the, Organize, uh, the organizational research methods literature, there had been no one who'd really brought this aspect of team ethnography, which in itself is quite a complex thing, right? When you think about, okay, as ethnographers, you are the instrument, you know, so, so how do you go, you know, it's quite a significant shift to go from this kind of singular instrument and that, that experience, that singular experience, which is so part of ethnography to a team. Um, as well as this global aspect, like bringing these two these two things together, we hadn't we hadn't really um, seen seen that. So we so we thought that that was kind of something unique that we could reflect on. Um, so yeah, I've covered the, the global aspect, and I think um, and the the other aspect I think is um, around this team based this team based stuff that we that um, that we talk about, and I think it doesn't even need to. Um, it's obviously quite specific to ethnography, some of what we talk about, um, but you could also, I think researchers could also get a lot from the paper um, if they're doing team ethnography is not even necessarily in relation to, to global phenomena. And there's, there's a lot of insights we, um, we were able to reflect, reflect on there. And in relation to, to the team aspect, the one thing that really stuck with me thinking about our projects in relation to um, managing teams in, within ethnography um, was that, of course, it's this matter of reflexivity sharing and sharing and discussion. I think that comes across in the paper that, that the team dynamics were central, but it's also a matter of research design, how you, how you manage this team. Um, so we, we kind of deliberately, or I, I guess a little bit, um, some of it happened by chance, but in retrospect, it, it worked very well. But these overlapping um, kind of points of immersion where two people will, would have at least some understanding of each of the particular sites that we were in. And at the same time, it was very purposefully designed so that um, Paula, the, the center of, of this project, let, let's face it, had understanding across all the sites. So she was more immersed in some, some um, organizations or some um, 
uh, sites in, in the study, but actually had an understanding, at least some touch point of every separate ones of these multiple sites that we were accessing the global um, through. And so I think these are matters of, yes, yes, we talk about the sharing, but these matters of design and research design when you're, you're thinking about um, teams and how, how you um, build these points of um, uh, shared reflexivity and able, being able to share um, aspects of the project, the research design element, I think, is really critical as well. And we talk about that. Mm, that's great. So when you so what, what you've just said has led me to another question. And I think this question is really pertinent when you think about like practice research, strategies, practice research. Yeah. And that's how is it that you study everyday practices, everyday micro practices in such yeah. a manner that it informs the understanding of ma a macro phenomena? Sure, absolutely. So we um for for us, um, we, we, we adopt Chatsky's um, definition of, of practices as um, spatially and, te and temporally dispersed nexuses of doings and sayings. So the way I describe it is that we basically follow that spatial or horizontal dispersion of the practices to, to the global. So follow them from this local site to, to another. Um, and I think that's very much adopting if um, uh, David Seidel's and, and Richard Whittington's um, uh, organization studies piece in 2014, this, this notion that they talk about flat um, practice ontologies and tall, tall practice ontologies. Like we were very much um, following um, these, these practices horizontally. Um, and so for us, that's where the, the multi-sided aspect comes in was our means to follow these 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 practices in multiple um well globally effectively um so and i think i think in this sense from from our perspective um we we were we were focused on the micro but basically for us the micro was the macro in that sense um, and so we, we got more understanding about how how the micro was the macro how these practices of technic and um, technicalizing and contextualizing risk were the market were the global reinsurance market through following it horizontally um, in multiple different different sites seeing how um, it was only through seeing how these different trading practices um, played out in Bermuda London, um, Europe, that we that we came to the true understanding about how they um, were dispersed in, in that way to construct construct the market. But for us, those practices were always the market, and it was just through following them horizontally that we got more understanding of of how um, how that that played out. Um, so yeah. Following, following the interactions. I think um, Marcus uses this term um, following um, in, in his discussion about um, global ethnography. And that's definitely how, how, I, thought, how I think about what, um, what we did. Um, so yeah, if I, if I break it down, um, what allowed us to follow the macro in the micro was clarifying our ethnographic object. You know the 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 um, this global practice. So the macro was was the practice that we were was embedded in the practice we were studying. Um, the multi sidedness was important. Um, the team dynamics gave us the capacity to follow these nexuses of practices horizontally um, uh, through, throughout the the, the um, global market. Um, yeah, and, and being able to have this mobility to, to follow, to follow um, across the different sites, I think was critical. Fantastic. When you talk about it, and when I read the piece, I got the sense that, you know, there was, there was, there was a lot of research impact from this study. And as researchers, research impact obviously is something that's really key. It's something that's really important. So I'd really appreciate some nuggets of wisdom mm -hmm. from you about research impact. Yeah, and I, I should mention, um, Paula did um, get a ESRC, um, the, the big UK um, Research Council Impact Award for, for, for this project. That's awesome. Um, 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think like for me, it comes down like in terms of ethnography, you're so often, to do ethnography well, you're, you're embedded in these contexts with via very close relationships with with the people you were you were studying, um, and those I guess um, who you want to have an impact with um, or on. Um, so these relationships that you build, like we were in this field for, for for two years, and often the data that was collected was only the tip of the iceberg in terms of, say, for example, the amount of um, meetings and interactions that that we had had with each of these organizations, you know, setting up access. And it's really these close relationships that, through which you can build that conduit um, through which impact can flow. So for me, um, I, I can't help but always assume ethnography is a really powerful route through which to, to have impact for, for that reason. Um, and I mean, I think for, for us, we were because of this close relationship, like we were building our practical kind of impact, like so the reports that the, the um, uh, giving feedback to, to, to companies kind of before the, the academic impact almost. So I think that's that's quite um, that, that's definitely always been my experience that you kind of are having the impact through the project um, rather than waiting for the paper to be published and that being the means through through which you um, you can have um, impact. But for me, um, what was particularly powerful about this piece was the simultaneous depth, right? So we were very much focused on the everyday lived experiences of, of these actors. So we, we were kind of in that sense, um, very much showing back to them their, their own world. They could recognize, they could recognize these what what we were telling them, but at the same time, because of the um the scope and the breadth, we were also putting this into a much wider um and dare I say quite impressive context that they didn't necessarily have um that same overview of, you know, with, with them being at the, in their particular organization. So there was this sense of um familiarity and you know that sense of um holding the mirror up to themselves and then being able to recognize themselves whilst also um, putting that in context and really um, having that capacity to surprise, I guess, through putting that in that global, that global context um, through, through, you know, the, through having followed those everyday practices globally. Um, and I mean, I guess that's always what good, good ethnography should do in a way is both be familiar <laughs> And strange to those who who um, you you have lived alongside and observed, um, and I think for us global that that global element was a really powerful way um, to to do that. I'll just say one more thing in relation to that. Um, yeah, I think we were being able to through focusing on the practices, we were able to really at globally we were able to really get a clear understanding of their importance so being able to show them that okay these everyday things that they are doing have these broader implications i think was was powerful okay thank you so much for those amazing insights rebecca my pleasure so, and for everyone who's listening i hope you are having as much fun as i am in the next vlog i'll be talking with paula jazabkowski about generating powerful stories from data such as this so stay tuned to that one and bye for now.